So, hey, Manuel, how are you? No I'm problem. doing good, Abek. How are you doing? I'm absolutely fine. Who is Manuel? Let's hear about you from you. So, just a little background about yourself for the uh, listeners. So my name is uh, Manuel Saez. I'm the, you know, I'm, a, I'm an industrial designer as a background. I live in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I'm a two times founder. Um, I recently uh, sold my last company, mm-hmm. and I'm currently writing about founders' mental health. Yeah. So, uh, what what did your uh, company do like the one that you sold? The the last company I had was a subscription service for e bikes and scooters. Yeah, uh, here in New yep, York City. So, that. yeah, so that was uh, a, people would uh, pay a monthly subscription and they would take the the scooter home and they use it and they don't want to bring it back. And we will provide service and maintenance, all the things that you needed to keep it to keep that that's good or running. Yep. Um. So how uh, we we'll talk about this. It's it's pretty interesting. But how did you get into what design? Like pro- I think uh, you only do product design. If I'm not wrong. Yeah, I I did in industrial yeah. design. Is what it's called. Yeah, industrial uh, design. But, sorry. Yeah, yeah. But what uh, what that is really is like pretty much everything. Everything that that you use, touch, you know, for anything, it's it's being created by somebody. Somebody's thought about it. Somebody designed it, or engineer some. So that's that's what we do. Like industrial designers yeah. create create products. So they understand the users and then design something and they get it to manufacture and they get it made. Um, so I did that. Um, you know, that was since I was young and a kid. I like to build stuff and make things, and and that kind of make that that was the closest career path to actually do something that I like to do, um, which you know was making things and creating. Uh, yeah, and then you know it, it's just you know you go to school and you learn how to make the things, and and <laughs> it's uh, pretty straightforward after that. Yeah. So, so in the hindsight, uh, design can be divided into two segments. One is like industrial design, and one is uh, like UI UX or product design. If I'm not <laughs> yeah, wrong. yeah. Well, I think I think you know it's uh, there are many design disciplines. Yeah, like yeah. like like yeah. you talk to a doctor, there are many kinds of doctors. Like you talk to a lawyer, there are many kinds yeah. of lawyers. So it works the same way. You know, design industrial design it it's refer most to things that are gonna be produced industrially. So anything that you design that you're gonna make millions or a lots of units, you know, a fork, a knife, that kind of thing, you know, it's like utensils, physical things, even the iPhone, you know, which mm-hmm. has an electronic component also it's it's you know, it needs to go through industrial design. There are other yeah. aspects of design which is more of a digital design which is I would say fairly new, but it's been you know around since computer interface are part of our lives, and that's yeah. happened you know whatever early late ninety nineteen nineties so whatever whenever the you know the the first computer uh, the first uh, I would say Macintosh was yeah. probably the first user interface design, and that's what they you know when when we start talking about that, but and that really. Talks about designing how you're gonna how you're gonna interact with a digital product, meaning a software, uh, which is another discipline. Yep, that's pretty interesting. Like I've not, I've met and I know a lot of designers, but I don't know a lot of industrial designers. Yeah, it's that's funny it. because, you know, when I went to school, there was no. I mean, there was digital design, but it wasn't called digital design. It was, it was just graphic design, and that yeah. you know, mo- most of the people that were doing graphic design were just things that you design to be printed on paper or do advertising mm-hmm. or the, the, the you know the stuff that is more of a two dimensional design that that goes on print. Yeah, those people became more mostly 
digital designers. A, a store, yes. you know, you still do print design, but it's hard to find everything that you see today. When even you talk about product design, most people understand that as a digital product design, and not necessarily a, a, an industrial design, which leads with, with deals, which deals with hardware. That's that's interesting. So, uh, like what, uh, like you said that, uh, in your opinion, Macintosh was kind of an, and it really was an, uh, in the industrial, uh, like Marvel at that time. Uh, so in yeah, the I mean, uh, so what yeah, do you I don't think, know. Uh, like what do you think made it, uh, something that which people look up to or which, and even today. When they create designs, that uh, many people want to create something like the Macintosh, but not exactly, but something that uh, brings uh, change in the society, like it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, a little bit of of the background that they they used to. I mean, I don't know if it's but they used to be back in the eighties, maybe late seventies, yeah. early eighties. Xerox, a Xerox was a company. That used to yeah. they, they did copier photocopy machines and they had a, an innovation park or the Xerox Park uh, mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley, and those are the guys that really designed the original interface, which was the the, the graphic graphic interface that we got to know later today and it's ubiquitous today on all on all every pretty much every operating system. What happens the, the difference is that prior to that you would need to enter commands in order to have the computer do stuff for you. So you would need to command things like, so it, it was only if, you know, only people that knew how to do that were able to actually interface mm -hmm. with, a, with a computer. And yeah. what the graphic, the, the user graphic interface did is make computers more accessible to people that did not know anything about coding or did not know how to access, uh, how to inter interact with a computer without, um, without actually typing the code or, or entering the, the, the query. So that's really what made it the big difference. Um, and of, of course, Windows also did that and, and that really yep. is what brought it to, to mainstream, but it, it was, you know, it was that prog progression of, you know, Macintosh, Windows, but everything came back from, came from zeros. But it was yeah, that ability to actually be able to, it, it's just when you create a better user interface, you, you allow all the people that are not necessarily technical people to actually interface with the machine and then actually use the machine, which opens up the market. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, uh, Apple started it and Microsoft kind of joined the party later on. Yeah, I don't know exactly what the, I'm sure there's some, everybody has a difference. But I don't know exactly what the story is. But my yeah. understanding is that Microsoft got to see, so first, Steve Jobs got to see that at Xerox. Yeah. And, yeah. and then he somehow either, I don't know, copy or whatever, whichever way he got it, but suddenly the Mac had that user interface and then Microsoft also had it. Uh, so it was, you know, w whatever it was, it was revolutionary and it was a, you know, industry changing you know, at that point. Made everybody, like, it, it, something that was accessible to a certain group of people now became accessible mm -hmm. to a lot more people. Yeah. They're initially, like, uh, Bill Gates and uh, Steve Jobs, they started out with this like goal or purpose only. Yeah. So apart, apart from that, let, let's talk a little bit about like beyond. I think the uh, beyond only the bike, uh, e-bike, the, the e-bike start. Yeah. If I'm not wrong. Yeah. So what, what did it do? Uh, and what does it do actually? And like, what is it? beyond so just to be clear I, I don't have anything to do with beyond right now it's not it's not my company anymore but yeah 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 what, yeah, yeah. So, well the company the yeah. company does is a subscription service 
for e-bikes and scooters. So yeah, people pay a subscription and they get to use the scooter. Yeah. Instead of buying it, right? So some yeah, yeah, instead yeah. of you spending you know whatever a thousand dollar in buying a computer, uh, a scooter, you just rented it for the month, use it, and bring it back when you don't need it. Yeah, that's that, that's like in cities like uh, New York, in bigger it's only, cities that yeah. it's only it's only New York right now. Yeah, that that's what I'm saying. That uh, in cities like New York and uh, bigger cities like that, it's a really big market for it. I think there's a really big yeah. market for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a big opportunity. You know, it's like when you know you don't if you don't want to spend all the money to buy a new thing or or you don't have the money, having right. access that way it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So now, uh, uh, now that uh, I think you have sold beyond to. Let's talk about the thing which you write about the most on Twitter. So, like, found in mental health and uh, everything that you uh, shed light on on Twitter. Yeah. Just, uh, just give a small, like, brief in- intro to that. Yeah. So, you know what? I, you know, I had, for the last 15 years, I've been running, I started two companies and I've been running them. Um, as a founder and part of the you know when you when when you're a founder it's a very lonely lonely job because yeah. there are really not many people that you can talk to and um, and the things that you deal with are not familiar to to most people so it, it becomes a very hard it, it becomes pretty hard at some point and um, and I never found anybody that I could go and talk about that that we'll be able to relate in a, in a in, that would understand really the challenges of the founder as as well as the emotional challenges that a founders go through in the job and all what I'm trying to do now is that is to write down and bring some awareness to the real need of fundamental health because most founders are going through something like that, but they're afraid of yeah. speaking out. Uh, there's really a, a a mentality that if you speak out, this that you're weak, that you're not strong enough, that you're not worth it. So there are a lot of things that are associated with uh, being open about any emotional issues that might come up, which are totally normal. That Yeah. That there's really no, no, you know, there's no room for it for that. You know, if you want to go and fundraise and you're fundraising, trying to raise money, and and that comes up, that's probably gonna be a a red flag from an investor. So it's it's not necessarily welcome. I mean, some investors, I won't say all investors. I think some investors would would see it that way. Yeah. So like, loneliness is one part. But it has like many uh, consequences. So, what what are the, uh, in your opinion and from the experience you've gathered, what are the main kind of like the consequences that loneliness and while building a startup, the the top three uh, most uh, tough emotionally tough things that founders so, might go through. I I think. You know, loneliness being one because you don't have nobody yeah. that can, to talk to that can relate. That yeah, can relate for sure. to. There are a lot of issues related with self-esteem. Like yeah, it's an imposter like, syndrome. It, no, well, the imposter syndrome. I think it's 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 easy to solve because it's just realizing that you really know stuff. But I think yeah. the, the the self-esteem is sometimes is reinforced negatively by. Because when you when you're a founder, a lot of bad things, not bad things, but things that are hard on your self esteem that happen to you, and you need to be ready for those. You're gonna get a lot of rejection. You know, things are not gonna work out. That's that's a normal stuff. That is ninety nine percent of the time. When things work out, it is the exception. So, it it you gotta be ready for that, and most people are not ready for that. Um, yeah. And then and then other thing too that that happen is. 
the the interrelationships between the people in the team and the people in your personal life is suffer a lot if you're not prepared, if you're not understanding what you're going through. Because you take things personal in different ways. There are things that that might hurt you that necessarily don't need to hurt you. They're not necessarily bad or they're nobody's doing anything yeah. against you. But so the relationships that you have suffer a lot too. So I mean, I'm, I'm telling you three, but there are many. You know, there's 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 so many aspects of this that it's it's really about having a framework to actually go on and get help when you need it. That's really what we need because they're, they're, this could be represented in many ways. Yeah. And uh, uh, how do you think, uh, how should uh, uh, founders take help? No, because uh, not a lot of them want to go to therapy or anything like that. So what is the ideal way to solve these problems? Yeah, well, that's 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 really what I'm trying to figure out. I mean, I, I would like to figure out to to put out some tools to help founders deal with this on their own as much as they can, or figure out a way to have some sort of network or peer support group in which talking about the thing is okay. Talking about yeah, feeling sad or you know being overwhelmed, all the things that happen that is okay and that, you know, the people can talk, even talking about it is it's already a, a, a way of healing. So that, that, that's really what, I'm, what my goal. I still don't know what that product is and that's part of it, my, my, my trying to understand what comes next here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what I've been doing for the last month is just writing on Twitter and putting it out there and and the and and just to hear feedback and hear what people say and and has been overwhelmingly positive. Like I get plenty of direct messages. People, a lot of people don't comment or don't say anything in public or commenting on the post themselves. But I get in private messages um, yeah. saying, "Yes, I went through that. Thanks for writing. Yeah, keep keep writing about this. I read it every day. It makes me happy. Or it, you know, this is the support I need." So there's yeah, there's right. a lot of uh, this is this is you know it's everybody's going through at some point um, so it's not a there there has to be a better way to deal with it than just like being quiet about it and and and, yeah. and hoping for you know, that it's gonna get better. Yeah, and I, I think what separates good startup founders from great startup founders is that how they take these challenges and figure out along the way. Maybe. Yeah. No, no, for sure. I think the, at least the ones that are happier, you know, there, there's, yeah. a, you know, even the, sometimes you, you know, the founders that get through the whole process and maybe get, take a company public, that is a very big achievement, but sometimes People that go through that, they're not still. They're still not personally fulfilled. They're still not. They yeah. still have something missing. So, understanding how to get there is the important part. Because even in difficulties, if you know where where you who you are and where you're going and what you're doing or why you're doing the things you're doing, it, there's a lot of peace inside you that can make everything easier. Make make everything worth it without necessarily being tied your self-worth to the final outcome. And and that yeah, is sure. what, understanding that is really changes everything. Yeah, that's absolutely great. Um, so what, uh, like like you said, a person who takes, uh, the startup founder who takes his company public has yeah. done something which not, which most which most uh, founders dream dream about yeah. and want to. So what what do you think? Why would a person not achieve fulfillment after that? I mean, I know that people have different <laughs> goals. People have way bigger goals, but like this is something which uh, I think is 
pretty big in my opinion. Yeah. So, look, I, I'm not saying that, you know, the people that take a company public are not achieving their no, dreams. Yeah, or yeah, their, no, their just, goal, I think. just for example, but, because, but, uh, yeah. The, what I'm saying is that there is certain sense of fulfillment inside you that only you know, only that person that, yeah. that is there knows. Yeah. And sometimes you suppress that with an expensive car, you suppress it with a trip, you suspend, you suppress that with many things that you can do because now you probably have more money, you have more access to things. And you can actually get distracted about not having fulfilled that own personal need that everybody sure. has inside. And that's what I'm saying that is key. But if you get yeah. to understand that at the beginning of your journey as a founder, your whole journey as a founder is going to be different from the point of yeah. view that you're not going to be stressing, suffering about things because you already understand what is the, the final goal is not necessarily to take the company public. I thought that is great and that is what everybody wants to do, but it's to do it in a way that is pleasing and enjoyable along the way. That the joy is not at the end once you get the company public. That's, yeah. that's what the mistake is. That everybody thinks I'm going to work my ass off every day, every night. doesn't matter. I'm going to sacrifice everything yeah. <laughs> because I know I'm going to be rich one day and I'm going to pay for everything. And yeah. that is what you get wrong because what, what really you need to think about is like, what makes me happy today and how can I add to the world and what is my contribution that I can get back happiness or joy every day. So everything that you yeah. do is aligned with that. And once you do that, pretty much nothing can take you down because you are already there. You already have it. You, you have it. So it, it, it's, it's like forgetting that is really when you get in trouble. Yeah. That's, that's, that's ready. <laughs> so uh, I think like in this space, people talk a lot about journaling. And you yeah. also like, I read a lot of tweets about journaling. Why do you think that journaling is so prevalent uh like in this field in this topic so journaling it has the, the, i think there are two aspects to it one is on the mm-hmm. practical side yeah if if you notice like the smartest people you're going to meet are people that can write well that that can yeah. that can string thoughts and ideas in a coherent way they can communicate clearly and briefly those people are normal normally are writers because they have been mm-hmm. going through through that exercise of getting thoughts from their head onto paper and they need to organize it in a way that they make sense as they come out. That okay. is a very, very good consequence of writing. It's it's like that is like on a practical side is very good because you can you can articulate ideas in a much better way. Now on, on the emotional side, on the spiritual side, what writing does is it it it, it it helps you be in the present moment, mm-hmm. enjoy, enjoying and getting the things out of your head onto the paper. And that exercise of getting things out of your head onto the paper, even if those things have no, you know, they're, they're mumbling thoughts, they're angry thoughts, it, they're thoughts of no relevance to anything else. They're all those things as they get onto the paper, they get out of your head and then that 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 has some sort of effect of lighting lighting the load of your thinking head because yeah. the, sometimes we get in trouble because our head gets to think too many things that are mm. not necessarily helping us and that's really what it's like that's why you meditate sometimes you know but in yeah. my case what what i use journaling is, is something different it's gratitude specifically it's, it's a practice called gratitude journaling i don't know if somebody is, there's a name for this but it's it's on those moments where everything is bad, nothing mm. works out. Life is a bitch in many ways. Yeah. <laughs> Sit down and write what you, what are the good things? What are you grateful for? And think about start with the most simple things, and then you can start expanding to the bigger things that are a grace in your life. Like I'm grateful that I can breathe. That I can tear breath, take that take the breath of air inside me, which is life, and I'm grateful yeah. for that. I'm grateful that I have my eyes and I have light coming into me, and I can perceive the world around me. I'm grateful that I'm talking to you. 
So there, yeah, there, may, there are many things that you, that you can ground yourself and really uh, understand how beautiful and, and, and how big that is yeah. for you to be like having that. So having the gratitude of having a friend that call you sometime to say hi when you needed somebody to talk to. Not, it, there's so many things that you can be grateful of. So the, the mm. practice of writing those things down on a daily basis reinforces that good things in your life which balances out all the other negative things that you're experiencing as a founder like you know you cannot get product to market fit the customers are not paying the things is like you know you got a big churn all the things that might be part of the business that are putting you down they can be counteracted with this and that's how you can bring some balance into your life and bring some perspective that the bad things that happen to you is not everything that is life. Life is not just those things. Although sometimes we are so into our business that we think that that is it. That if we don't, you know, get the next round of fundraising, the world ends. So those are the things that I think brings that perspective. And that's why gratitude to journaling is very helpful. It's very, it, it's a good tool to actually keep your head balanced. So, uh, what do you uh usually apart, apart like gratitude journal is uh, like one thing when you do like normal uh journaling do you dump all your thoughts on the paper or is there any structure to it or anything no i have i have one one notebook one one journal whatever you want to call it so it's the one, it's just only one that I use for everything. So yeah. if I have a call with somebody, I take notes on that call. If if I have a meeting, I take notes on the meeting. If I want to start the day, I want to make a list of what I want to, all my goals for the day are, I, I, I write them there. And right after that, I would do my gratitude journaling. And right after that, I would write some thoughts about something that I'm thinking about to write a next a blog post about it. So everything goes in there. So I don't have 10 journals, one for this and one for that. I just have one that everything goes in there. And when I start yeah. writing about anything, you know, so I have one place to go back and look at things. It's one book that I carry with me all the time. So it's yeah. on, the, on the practical side, it's, it's only one thing. It doesn't need to be pretty. It's like whatever works for me might not work for somebody else. But the, but the, the goal is to be able to write things, to 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 have the ability to write them down and have a record of it. Yeah. Uh, so recently, like, I read your tweet, I think it, you tweeted yesterday, that I have developed a relationship with the voice in my head. His name is uh, Pedro. Uh, what uh, is that? That was so, interesting. So I think, I don't know if the tweet is there, but... Uh, I think I don't recall exactly what the tweet said, but the bottom line is that, you know, we all have a, a voice in our head and it's, it's just yeah. us. Sometimes that voice is saying, don't make the phone call. Nobody wants to talk to you or don't do this or don't do that. Or you looking too fat or you looking too thin, whatever it is. It's, it's a critical voice that is not helping in many ways. So yeah. that voice in my head, I call him, it's, it's got a name, it's Pedro. Yeah. And Pedro, Pedro is, it, it's, it's me in many ways. And, and yeah. it's me and, and, and there is another voice that is more of the wise voice too. And the voice is there to counteract, you know, to balance out Pedro. But, it, you know, what, what, what I'm trying to say is like the voice in your head sometimes is saying the things to protect you or to do just to, to be some sort of, it, it, it's not that you need to ignore it. You just need to accept it and recognize it that is there and do not need to believe it either. So if the voice yeah. says that you're too fat, it's something you just need to think about it. Okay, maybe I'm too fat. Okay, you know, accept it. Okay, there's there's a possibility of that being the case. And that's it. Yeah. It's not like I'm too fat. Oh, I cannot go out or I need to go on a diet. No, it's just something there. 
that might have come up because maybe you you do you are maybe overweight and you need to do something about it and maybe do exercise or watch your diet or whatever it is. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person, that that you are uh, a, a loser or that you are any any other way. It's just yeah. one statement in in the addition of many other statements that makes you like you're also a bright person. You're a very nice person. You're so there are many other other things that make you. So that is not just defined. The, so it's not to listen to Pedro that defined me as a fat person. Yeah. That, that, uh, it, that it, if, even if that was a bad thing. I mean, you know, like I, I love the way I am. So it's not like, a, and, and you know, I'm not a thin, uh, skinny person either. So, so it it is it is just one more thing that you need to consider there. And uh, some people, what some people do is reject that person or reject Pedro, reject the voice in your head and ignore yeah. it. And that yeah. gets more complicated because it gets worse. That voice mm. it becomes louder and louder. So if you recognize it and you understand, okay, it's there, I understand, I hear you, I got you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knock yeah. it down. <laughs> okay, I got this. And they move on, not necessarily being believing that thing that that is what's happening. Yeah. Same thing, you know. Sometimes you know you're, I don't know, make one of maybe you you want now. I want to call this guy to be in the podcast. Oh, but he might not want to talk to me because you know I'm a kid in India. Who who want to talk to this kid in India? I don't know if it happened to you. I'm just I'm just saying. Uh, yeah. That is that is your Pedro. That is your Pedro. Yeah. And and you probably doing a good job managing your Pedro because you made those phone calls, you reach out to people, and you make things happen. So yeah, you you understand what the 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 the, the, the reality of somebody believing Pedro and somebody accepting Pedro, but not necessarily believing him. All have that voice inside your head. Not a lot of people notice it because most of it is done subconsciously and. We keep thinking, overthinking, all these things. But uh, now that you uh, have like shed light on this, I can't get it out of my head. Well, that's it. That's the thing. You know, <laughs> the first step, the first step to any change in your life is recognizing it or being aware of. It. Yeah. So, and, and sometimes it's not necessarily to make the change. Hmm. It's just to be aware of and accept it, and accept it, the the circumstance, the way the things are, and not feel guilt about it, and not take on a negative spin about things. Um, so it, it it's just about being aware. Is is ninety nine percent of the work. <laughs> I would say whatever. It's, it's like being aware is the is the number one thing that you need to do, and then once you're aware. Then you can make your own decisions about it. You're not being driven by Pedro. Yeah. And then, like, if you look at it from another perspective, uh, Pedro is kind of like your uh, undercover best friend because he leads you to thinking on some time. Uh, whatever the voice inside your head says can be correct, can be right. Yeah. And can yeah, yeah. force you to like, act upon it. Absolutely. I, imagine, you know, Pedro, it's like you're going out, you're, you're new to New York City, for example, and you go yeah. into a back street and there is a store there that, you know, and Pedro says, mm, this looks sketchy, man. Let's not, I, I don't, I don't want to go in here. That's Pedro talking. Oh, that, that yeah. looks very sketchy. That might be right. You know, it's like, but you still can make your own decisions to go there. And you know, walk inside the store and do you know, it's like. But Pedro doesn't know anything, and he mistrusts everybody, and he will say, "No, no, I don't want to be here. This is not. <laughs> I'm not familiar with this. I want to be out. You know, I want to be out." So, but will you becoming aware of that? It gives you the warning. Okay, there might be a problem here, and then you can check with other input that you might get. Oh no, I see. I understand. This is the way it works here. No, this is the way it is. This is okay. Okay, Pedro, don't worry about it. This is good. We're going in, or you yeah. say like, no. What Pedro said gets reinforced by this other sign that I see here, and this other other thing that I'm looking over there. No, this thing is not like there are three things that 
It's Pedro and two more signals telling me that I gotta get out of here. I'm gonna get out of here. Oh my god. That's actually, that's the those thoughts are like they don't come usually to every person, but yeah. Yeah. So with all these thoughts and uh, everything that you read about the mental health of founders and uh, all of these things, how do you come up with these thoughts? It's like this uh, Pedro thought. This is something that I, lo- I love. I love this. This is incredible. Oh, how did you come up with How do I come up with it? It's, yeah. uh, I guess I'm old, man. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I think uh, it's uh, I don't know. It's <laughs> it's uh, it's there. It's like you you rationalize things. I don't know how. Yeah, you know, it's it's it's, it's experience. I guess. I guess it's uh, years of suffering and trying things that didn't work. Yeah. Uh, until you figure things that work, and that's why you share. And again, you know, what worked for me might not work for other people, and that's that's okay. For but sure. uh, but yeah, but my goal my goal is to share what worked with me, and have a, I'm having a good time with it. In, in terms of, for me personally, it's very rewarding. Um, it's very rewarding to help for me, as a yeah. And uh, and this seems like uh, something that. I know I needed it when I was a founder, and I know other people needed it too. So, mm-hmm. seems like it's making sense. Um, it's making sense, and in, 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 in investing the time and effort into 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 doing this. Yeah, for sure. So uh, let's. Let, I'll, I'll ask a question based on that. So, uh, I'm working on a start myself right now. And we are like planning on doing some big things, and we have big goals and all these things that we want to achieve. So what would you advise me before I get like start with it? Um, look, I don't know if I want to give advice, man. Maybe what, <laughs> what I'll maybe what I'll do is I'll ask you a question. I ask you why you doing this. I mean, to let's what? say to uh, create impact. The answer may vary for uh, different people, but to create impact or to uh, make the world a better place. Let Let's say something like that. And yeah. and uh, okay. And why 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 would why would you want to do that? Uh, so that. When I die, and the future generations, the future generations can and create a better world actually for the future generations to come and uh, innovate further, based upon that. Okay. Uh, okay, good. I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. I think. <laughs> I. I, I, I what I'm going to is I think you really need to question yeah. why you're doing the things you're doing. Yeah, for sure. And and I think a lot of people would say the same thing as you're saying in terms of that is the right answer because you know I want to make the world a better place. Yeah. But I think if you if you keep this exercise asking yourself why mm-hmm. about why you want to keep the, the world a better place and why and and, and just dig a little bit deeper into it until yeah. you want to really get to your purpose until you're like, okay, this is why I'm doing this. Yeah. And then once you get to the purpose, that's the really mean like what you're doing now, what your goal is today of doing that. I don't know what the goal of your company is. You say you have big goals and achievements. Yeah. yeah. Once uh, you so... get to the why, to the why, to the real why of why you're doing what you're doing, what your purpose is, that goal and achievement might not be a goal and achievement you want to do anymore. Yeah. Or, or or it might be. Or it might be. But yeah. bottom line, what I'm saying is that as you go with the startup, things are going to change and, and the world's going to change and everything's going to change. But if you have really come up to your purpose, 
to the to the right purpose, that probably is not going to change. So once, if you get to your purpose, to what you're doing, or what the, the why of what you're doing, the things that you're doing, everything becomes a lot easier. All decisions become a lot easier. What's happened sometimes to founders is like, okay, I want to design, or I want to create this product to solve this problem for these people, and this is the best thing that happened to me because whatever. <laughs> it's yeah. like whatever, whatever it is. And yeah. something happened and keeps you from doing that. I say you could not fundraise and your company goes under. Yeah. And then what happens to you? Your life is the end. It's like because you cannot make the product. But if you have really a purpose or you have a goal, you have you have really a clear vision of where you're going with, with your life, that doesn't matter if that falls down. But you're gonna find another way to get that done. Or to to get to, to, to get and fulfill your purpose. So yeah. It's, I don't know if I answered your question, but no, no, <laughs> ask, you, that, that ask was... yourself why. Ask yourself why, 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 why I'm doing this. Yep. Is that really? Is that really necessary? Is that really? Is that really what the world needs? Is that? Is that like? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, I, I have this vision, and I know the purpose for why I am building this. But it's like the more the. The uh, deeper you dig into it, the more uh, it can become better, it can become worse. Yeah. Depends on the purpose that you initially started out with. But yeah, I think I do have a clear purpose, but sometimes it does uh, get tangled in when there are a lot of different things involved. But yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. And, 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 and things change. So you know, things yeah, change. Yeah, for sure. You know? So it's it's having that flexibility inside too. It's it's important. Yeah. What are your thoughts on, uh, like we talking about purpose? What are your thoughts on Ikigai? Have you read the book and? Yeah, yeah, what yeah. yeah. Makes you... So look, I think uh, I I had a. There are different Ikigai moments, and and yeah, and I think this might might apply to. I think when I started my previous company, I went through that whole process that I was telling you. you know, it's like trying to understand who, yeah. who I am, who I am, what I what, so, who I am a designer, right? That's that's really what I've been trained for. That's what I know. For sure. I I just happen to be good at it. So I'm a designer from one side, then. What am I passionate about? I have a, a big passion for two wheels, motorcycles, bicycles, that kind of yeah. thing. And, and what fulfills my life, what makes me really happy is to help people. So those are the three circles from this Ikigai thing. And then in the middle is where my Beyond Company came in. So with my Beyond Company, I could fulfill all the things. I could design the products. The products were motorcycles, or scooters, or bikes. And what we were doing is providing a service that would help people to move in the city in, a, in, a, in the best, yeah. in the most environmentally friendly possible way. So that was an Ikigai moment for me in which I got to a place in which, okay, all the things balance and that place in the middle is where, 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 where I fulfill my life. But again, yeah, I've been through that stage and now I'm not there anymore. And then I'm going through the same process. But today, instead of saying, I still want to help people, that is very fulfilling for me. I still like motorcycles. Yeah. But I think I'm a designer, but now my life has changed. I'm not a designer only. Now I'm also a founder and have somebody yeah. that has experience building company. Yeah. So that enters also on this Ikigai thing. And what I'm doing now is just defining that's what I'm saying. I'm putting this thing out there in Twitter for a month or so to ask mm -hmm. questions about if this is something that I can put my, my effort and help people out. So far, the, the, the answer has been positive. So I'm discovering my Ikigai for the next stage of my life. So I had an Ikigai for the last eight years. Now I'm looking for yeah. the next one. And But I have clarity about what I want. You know, I, I know... That I that that what drives me and what makes me happy is to help people. When I'm helping people, it's a very selfish thing because I it's my own reward. It's the best thing that makes me happy. 
but it's the best thing that could actually I can output to the world because this the best thing that I can do is to help other people. So that is the that is the good is a good symbiosis there. Being a founder, having experience of building companies, also a positive thing. So we're gonna put it in, and then we mm-hmm. have you know a lot of motorcycles and riding motorcycles. So we're looking at how we're gonna put that spin into the whole thing and get that ikigai moment. Yeah, that's a great thought. That so, uh, I think we talk a lot about money. So, what motorcycle do you own? Actually, I'm I'm. Right, right now, I, I always, you know, had a motorcycle, and and I use, I what I do is, I fi- I get an old motorcycle and I fix it, yeah. and it takes me a month or so. It takes me a long time, mm-hmm. but I do it with a very a lot of mindfulness, and and it's like uh, sit down, take it apart, clean the parts, clean everything, replace the parts that you need to replace, put it back together, and all is like a therapy for me. And mm-hmm. and, and it's it's a process, and you go through it, and you fix something, you get something that's been dead, back to life. Everything, all that is really rewarding, and I've been doing that for a long time. But right now, what I'm riding as of today, the only motorcycle I have is um, it's a, uh, an electric. It's it, it looks like a like a Vespa. Yeah. But it's electric. But it's electric. Uh, that's. I I don't uh, know a lot about motorcycles. I'm more of a car guy. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's an electric. It's an electric uh, electric motorcycle. Yeah, that's. And I have. I think I've seen a Vespa. I think, yeah. It looks like um, yeah. yeah I'm sure you've seen it. It's like very iconic. For sure. Very, very, very popular. So why did you? When did this like motorcycle thing began? Because you were a industrial designer. You started out as an industrial designer. So I think it. Yeah originates from that part only but yeah. what do you think where where did it uh, the motorcycle fanatic came from oh where, where did that come from so yeah. it came from because i'm from argentina so in argentina i was riding motorcycle and i imagine india might be similar too but in argentina everybody rides a motorcycle and yeah. i start riding when i was 10 i had my own 10 or 12, I had my own motorcycle. It wasn't a big motorcycle, it was a small, was a small yeah. little motorcycle, but yeah. I had my own. And I had always motorcycle, and then when I was in high school, I used to buy broken motorcycles, like, a, you know, motorcycles that are on a box, meaning like they somebody tried to fix it, they couldn't fix it, and they put all the parts in a box, and they sell it for cheap. So I used to buy those, put them together, and sell them. And, and that was my first uh, entrepreneur business. In you know, yeah, when I was in high school. Um, but, and yeah, I guess that carried on. I guess forever. Do you think uh, you might start like a motorcycle company in the future? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You might. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think it it could be it could be fun, but. Uh, um, it's a very capital intensive business. So, sure. and and whatever whatever is, it it needs to be sufficiently different, and there has to be enough of a reason for a new motorcycle company or a new motorcycle as a vehicle to exist. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think. Uh... That's that was an incredible conversation. Okay. And usually I end with, uh, what what advice would you like like to give to people who are just starting out on the journey? And who might be watching this and might be like young builders or young farmers. What advice uh, do you have for them? One advice. Dude, I, you you know that my newsletter is called Advice Myself. Yeah. So advice yeah, them. And I, <laughs> no, no, no. But, but my point is, 
It's called yeah. advice myself because I don't want to advise other people. <laughs> that's, that's, that's 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 what I'm going. So oh. I don't know, man. I think it's it's about I don't know. Just be you. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Just like it's but, all whatever I say. It just doesn't really matter what I say. Man. That, it doesn't that, matter. That's kind of true. But it can have a like a significant impact on some people. And yeah, no impact on others, but depends from person to person. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's it from my side. Anything you'd like to say? No, that's it. That's it. I appreciate very much your uh, you reaching out and uh, enjoy the conversation. And if there is anything that I can do to help you, let me know. If anybody listening, anything I can do to help, let me know. <laughs>